Good evening. Welcome to Paranormal Experience with Kent Hobson. A lot of you probably know, and if you didn't, now you do, that I am having some problems with my throat, and I am having surgery on throat, fr excuse me, on Friday, this Friday actually, and I will be back after that. But I'm having problems speaking long enough to do a full show, and I know sad, right? That I decided that the best thing I can do is play one of my favorite guests of all time. He is my research partner. He is the founder of the Central Alabama Spirit Paranormal Investigative Research. That may be wrong, but Casper. He is the co-founder, my co-founder, with Answers. The American Noetic Science Research Studies. And we are just having so much fun learning and checking things out and just being blessed to be able to have the chance to do what we want to do. So without further ado, here is Frank Lee. I hope you all enjoy it. This is a great show. This is from 2018, before we ever even really understood that we wanted to start delving into noetic science. It's great. Y'all will enjoy this. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Reaching all the way back to 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition. Here is your host of Fate Radio, Kat Hobson. Hello there and welcome to Fate Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so excited about tonight's show. It's not often that you get to celebrate such a fantastic friend joining you on your show, but I'm fortunate I get to tonight. My guest is Frank Lee. Frank is the founder of CASPER, Central Alabama Society for Paranormal Investigation and Research. He is the former host, who I hope is on hiatus and will be joining us at some point, of Paranormalities and Ponderings. It is a fantastic show that I'm looking forward to getting back. He is one of the best and most innovative paranormal researchers in the field, in my opinion. He has great ideas. He is not afraid to go old school. He does a really interesting group of experiments. We utilized some this weekend as we were doing investigations. And, you know, he just really is one of the nicest people on the planet. You just can't get much better than that. So I want y'all to welcome and enjoy my friend, Frank Lee. Hey, Frank, how are you? I'm doing great, Kat. How, how about yourself? So far, so good. I am excited to be well, welcoming you. This is going to be great. Well, it's always a pleasure to to chat with you. You know, I um, always uh, enjoy our conversations, and and I feel like I owe you like twenty dollars for that intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, you just you know, we'll take that out, and you put the twenty in your pocket, and if you decide to bring your show back, you talk to me first. How's that? Okay, you got a deal. <laughs> I think I think I got the better end of that stick. That, um, you, you know, that, that is something that, um, <clears throat> you, you know, my schedule has been pretty crazy of the past year or so. And, um, that, that is something I definitely miss. Um, Donald was, um, over at the house just, just the other night. Donald is our, um, operations director for, for Casper and, Handles all the stuff in the background that that makes me look good when I go out and talk to people for about Casper. And me and him were just talking about how much um, we're missing getting 
doing videos and a lot of that. Well, and um, you you do a good job, so obviously you would miss that. So, so yeah, we're um, we we really want to uh, get something going, you know, definitely because we miss it. Well, you know, he is such a riot anyway. And oh know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you were doing controlled chaos, your your Facebook live show. I love that mm-hmm. so much because it's two tech guys who are sitting there with some of the best information and some of the most innovative combinations of equipment. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a good way. I do need to Well, you know, the that. funny thing is uh, on, um, well, you know, we, we did this on the radio as well. Um, you know, we act goofy. We, well, we're not really acting. But, but, you know, we <laughs> don't put much of a filter out there, you know, and just say the first thing that pops in your mind. And, um, you, you know, but the good thing is we try to, you know, to have fun with it. I, I told somebody the other day that we were making fun out of or making fun of serious paranormal research, but in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Absolutely in a good way. But, you know, that's one of the best ways to teach. And you're a fantastic teacher. You, um, well, you do I, a great I, job I, of getting your ideas across. And that'll be another 20. Teasing. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> that, um, you, you know, honestly, I, you know, the, and this um, might sound strange to, to some people. But I enjoy the the teaching aspect of it and helping others learn, I believe, more than I do the investigation itself. That, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love to go on a good investigation. But, but when I can sit there and teach people and, you know, research ideas, and that, that is my happy place. Well, you know, I have been speaking with people, as have you, for years, and there are actually normal university classes, not just the Ryan Institute and places of that nature, Mm -hmm. but mainstream colleges who are accepting and seeking paranormal, I'm sure they're not calling it paranormal, but but paranormal classes, (laughs) and I've Mm -hmm. had... I've often thought that you should approach, I mean, we live in a town that has so many universities. You should approach some of them and, you know, bring your parapsychological ideas to them and present them in that way. I think that would be fun. And, um, you, you know, I actually wouldn't mind doing that. That, and that is something I, I need to, to check into. Um, and, and I think something that I really enjoy is, you know, showing people, okay, you've seen what's on TV. You see what's in the movies. Okay, now here is how it really goes. This is, you know, these are the misconceptions. This is, you know, and, and kind of clearing that water because, because there is such a difference in paranormal pop culture and actual paranormal research. Um, you think? You know, that's something, oh yeah, we, you know, that's something I know we've talked about so often and, and, you know, it, it's funny because that's, well, well, that's like, you know, the past two nights in a row, I've got to investigate alongside you and, you know, it, it still feels like I haven't got to talk to you enough because we're, <laughs> we're all the time. You're, you're one of my, um favorite outlets for getting some of these ideas out and saying, Hey, what do you think of this? You know, you know, you're, you're, you're a great sounding board for me to balance across some of these wacky ideas I get. Well, you know, when my eyes cross, it's a little bit too deep though. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, well, I believe that I believe I was just telling you yesterday that, you know, you, you get this stuff a lot more than I think even you realize. Well, I've actually had a very good teacher, and 
I appreciate that. Thank you. One of the things that I found is I don't have to Google some of the terminology anymore. Mm -hmm. I found that to be true with um, Keku's writings as well. So I'm starting to get the hang of some of this stuff. I love what we do. I, mm -hmm. I think that helps to be able to absorb it a little better because it's a topic I enjoy greatly. One of the things that mm -hmm. I like the best about our conversations is that you are science-based mm -hmm. almost entirely. You're a little, you've lightened up a lot. I always joke about, <laughs> yeah, seriously, I always joke about you, you know, smudging that attic for me because I couldn't reach, but you've, you know that that works at times. And if nothing else, it's a palliative or it will just help with the mindset either way. And you're open right. to things like that. You're not just so locked in. You can't conceive, you know, you won't open up a little bit to that. And you've taken right, me to absolutely. the science, but you've taken me to the science side a lot more mm -hmm. because there's room for both in this study. Well, definitely, you know, well, when you, when you think about the spiritual side of it, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's a completely intangible subject. You can't, you can't study it because you can't take it in a lab and, you know, measure it and get those quantitative results. But the thing of it is what we're ultimately studying, uh, especially when I'm at it, you, you know, I tend to stay more on the parapsychology side of, side of the house. And what, you know, when you think of it, essentially, what are we studying? We're studying human consciousness, how it reacts with the environment, how it reacts with other forms of consciousness, how it responds to energy, how energy and environments respond to it. And a huge part of that human consciousness, you know, is the spiritual side. It, it doesn't matter how we're looking at it, you know, whether I'm saying, okay, well, this is the mind working at what's the alpha waves of this frequency, the beta waves are here. And, you know, are, if I'm saying, yes, this person's having a spiritual experience, we're, we're describing the same thing. So it is absolutely um, relevant. Yes, it is. And, so few people actually will pause to contemplate that. What do you find is the best way to get that across to people that just won't bend? Or do you just want well, to you know, I, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, whether you're talking about research, comprehension, just anything, 99% of any situation is your mindset. You you pick whether your you know whether whether your day is going to be a good one or a bad one. You pick whether the glass is half full or half empty. You I mean all these are choices you make. Um, how you choose to interpret information is up to you. And perspective. I, I, I want you to think about this, Cap. Um, say me and you are staring at a house that. You know, maybe maybe it's one we've never seen before, but, you know, we're looking at it. And I'm standing in the front yard looking at this house. Well, you're standing in the backyard looking at it. And we try to describe to each other the house we're looking at. Well, I'm going to say, you know, if I'm in the front yard, I'm going to say, well, you know, it's, you know, uh, got the windows with the. It's got four windows across the front with shutters, it's red door, um, a little stoop at the front. Um, and, um, you know, there's a couple of, uh, of shrubs around the front door or shrubs around the door here and a sidewalk going up to it. Whereas you're going to be saying, I don't see any of that. I see a patio back here with some some French doors going out onto it. There's about five windows and there's a garage to the side. Which one of us is right? Exactly. Perspective. So mm -hmm. that's, you, you know, and that's something that so many people fail to realize. And 
the only way that you can see it my way is if you're willing to give a little bit to walk around to the front and look at it from the same angle, same with me. I have to walk around to the back to see what you're seeing. And when you get that whole picture, then we're talking about the same place. Absolutely. And, and it's very much that way in any field of research. Which, thank goodness, right? We need that. Uh -huh. Yes. And, well, you know, and a lot of people, when when you say, um, you know, when you tell people that, you know, you tend to be more scientific, they, a lot of people kind of have a negative connotation in their mind already when, when you tell them that because they think, oh, he's a debunker. And no, that's not true. Paranormal activity is very real. It happens all the time. But the difference is, um, I, you know, I don't even like the word debunk. Um, because to me, when, when I hear debunk, I'm automatically thinking, okay, well, they had to debunk it because somebody was trying to fool someone else. Or, you know, there's kind of has that connotation to it. Um, you know, I, I like to say explain for right. that reason, because, you know, you know, if I go out with the mindset of I'm going to debunk what's going on here at this house, then that, that sounds like me saying, well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to show them where it's not haunted, where it's just somebody playing a prank. It's a hoax. If I say, I'm going to explain what's going on, that, that kind of sounds more like I'm leaving my options open to, to what I might find there. Um, whether it be paranormal or something naturally occurring. And, you know, even, even if you do come at it from a scientific mindset, um, that doesn't mean that there can't be something paranormal there. That just means that you're going to methodically approach the situation and roll out every possible naturally occurring phenomena first. That's right. And you did so, come across things that you cannot do that with. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when, when I've gone through my checklist, which is a very long one, of every possible occurrence that, that it could be, and I'm still drawing a blank, and I just have to say, you know, I guess that's just paranormal. That makes my day. That thrills me more than anything. <laughs> so few people realize that about you. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you, you know, that's, uh, I, I think that's something that makes me a little different from a lot of people that tend to be more skeptical. Um, is, you know, my thrill isn't showing where it's fake. Or showing where uh, where oh no that that was just misinterpreted my thrill is when i throw my whole arsenal of weapons to explain it and get defeated that oh. is you know to me that just blows my mind that's what keeps me awake at night it's like okay well i couldn't explain what could it be how could this be working and and this, um, you know, to, to me, that's, that's when I become like a kid at Christmas. I have to tell you that I love that moment that that happens to you too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. You've it, seen the look I get on my face. <laughs> I know. And I know that you are so analytical and you're so methodical. We are like the antithesis of each other in a lot of different ways when we're approaching paranormal experiences. But I know what you put into trying to find a logical, physical reason for the, whatever to occur. Mm -hmm. And when you can't, it's like my Christmas too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm like, uh, yay. I, I, I think you just love seeing that bewildered but excited look on my face. <laughs> well, that too. There is that. But I absolutely get excited because I know how hard it is for something to pass all of your criteria. 
I know what that list entails for the most part. And when you get there, then that's validation for whatever I've been experiencing and documenting or you know, trying to, if it feels like that to me, right, then mm -hmm. I get excited because then we really have achieved a form of communication with something that we don't know because we don't know who that is. Uh Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's been several times we've had that happen on investigations where, you know, I, you know, I'm bringing in the measurement equipment and, you know, going through the, going through my um, list of methods to, to find out what is, what is really going on. And, you know, you're kind of going more to the spiritual side with it, but even through everything I do, everything you do, instead of one counteracting the other, we're meeting in the middle and coming to the same conclusion. And to me, that is golden. It is. And it's really rare to have people that work together that well, I think, from, mm -hmm. from different sides of the spectrum like that. And mm -hmm. I think we're very fortunate that we can do that. So. Well, you know... I, I see a, a, a common pitfall that I see a lot of uh, paranormal teams get themselves into, and and this is one that I've always tried to avoid, is, you know, you people say, well, this person thinks this way or does this, so we don't want them on our team. Mm -hmm. You know, we we want to get a group of like-minded individuals together to look for paranormal activity. Well, you know. That's fine and dandy, but where's your diversity? Where, who is, if you all think the same way, then who's going to pick up what you're not thinking of? Right. He's got, need that diversity of mindset. If you lock down, you know, you're not going to accomplish anything. Right. You, you need to be challenged. I, you know, um, and, and I always tell everyone on the team that, you know, hey, if I say something and you don't agree, you know, that, that because this is one of my pet peeves. I see these teams out there that, you know, where, where whoever is the lead investigator or whatever, they, um, you know, that is like, God forbid you, you disagree with the leader. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's like, no, you can't be that close minded or egotistic. You have got to be willing to have your ideas challenged because that's that's where you learn from and actually grow. Because I may I may have it in my mind that some this goes one way and you might observe something that I'm not looking at and point it out to me. And by you pointing out what you're seeing that I'm missing then that might be the missing piece I needed to make the discovery I was wanting to make. Right. I agree. The, oh, you know what? We need to go to break. I apologize. <laughs> so we're going to be gone about three minutes, and anyone who knows us knows that if we get started on these things, it, it just rolls. So... We're going to take a three-minute break, and we will be right back. Y'all enjoy this.
listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. And just like that, we are back. You're listening to Paranormal... No, you're not. You're listening to Fate Radio with my guest, Frank Lee. So I am so excited that you're here. Thank you. We were... Well, you're quite welcome. You know, it's I, I'm always, always honored to, to, to be a guest because, you know, I, I always enjoy talking with you, bouncing ideas back and forth with you and... You know, it's great when we can have a conversation on the air, too. <laughs> I know, but we do get immersed, don't we? So, mm -hmm. I, I was enjoying what, what you were saying about the diversity of team members because both Casper and my primary team, Scare of Alabama, actually, mm -hmm. I'm on both, so I don't guess I really have a primary, but are both very diverse and interesting groups of people because with SCARE, there are authors and computer programmers and or software developers. There are an insurance agent who is also a wonderful author or an, he does something with insurance. Ladarius is a social media mogul or developing into one and then me and Wanda who is Native American and then Blaine who is also Native American and Jennifer who is just fascinating when we come to your team the chief founded mm -hmm. it's the same thing I don't know what mm -hmm. everyone there does for a living yet but it's just such a diverse group of people and it's kind of the absolutely mindset. Um, you know, one thing about it is, th think of it this way. If you put together a football team, how would it function if everybody was quarterbacks, but you didn't have any linemen? Well, the quarterback would look awful sore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You, you know, you need your quarterbacks, your nose guards, your offensive tackles your defensive tackles you know everybody has their own role and you know it's it's not everybody having the same mindset that makes a team strong it's by bringing in those diverse functions those specific functions that you know you might be a lot better at something than i am so by me relying on you where i lack and vice versa that you know that's what really helps a team excel and pe people um forget about that well yes and i find that it's the teams that do forget about that that are are too quick to have all skeptics or are too quick to you know write anything off that they don't agree with because as a unit they're there too disprove everything because nothing can actually be paranormal they lose a lot they miss a lot mm -hmm. and definitely you're not that way at all you're even though you're such you're so strong on the science side i, I met a friend this spring who is such a science person and i actually mm -hmm. call him the you know high science guy when i talk to him and he has such an interesting perspective he you know he compares the scientific to the woo-woo factor as it is there's mm -hmm. they don't they're not polar opposites as you said mm -hmm. and i i think it's interesting that you have that that you're aware of that and a lot of people are but people mm -hmm. see psychics as just kind of a odd thing sometimes well, you know, the funny thing about it is, is you know, with me being more in parapsychology, um, a lot of a, a lot of the subjects that 
or, or the ways that I describe something would be very similar to what a um, to, to what someone who's a medium or a sensitive or someone who is very spiritual would describe it. The only thing that's different really is our terminology, but we're still talking about the same thing. But this goes back to that front of the house, back of the house analogy we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, whereas I might say place memory, um, you know, someone who is a medium might, or even a regular investigator might refer to it as residual energy. But we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking about energy that's left over from a living person that replays itself. And then you um, have those that call it the stone tape theory. Mm-hmm. So. That's, and, and, you know, so many people fail to realize that. And, and like you like you were just saying, when, when you put a team together, it's all skeptics. Who's there to say, okay, that's fine, but how do you explain this? Exactly. The openness has to be there. Or if you, mm-hmm. if, if somebody tells you, that they can explain everything that happens in any type of anomalous situation, then mm-hmm. you don't even want to talk to them anymore. Oh yeah. They're not I, being I tell honest. people all the time. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time. If you, if you ever hear anybody refer to themselves as a paranormal expert, run <laughs> and don't listen to another word that person says, because let me tell you, I, you know, last month made 19 years that I've been doing this, and I'm as far from an expert as they get. I I have a few good guesses. I get lucky every once in a while, but as far as being any kind of an expert, no. I just I'm just somebody that's had nearly 20 years of thinking about it and coming up with a few theories. But that is it. <laughs> I still got so much. I, there's a lot more that I don't know than what I do know. We'll, we'll say that. And, um, you know, everything that I say, I might be completely wrong. But, you know, something that I see so often is people with such an inflated ego that if you challenge anything, they say they're offended, upset. But, I mean, that's just you know, something you do not do. And they, they limit themselves. They put themselves into such a small box by doing that. Absolutely. They do. Uh, But you know, every theory that I've got might be proven wrong tomorrow and that's okay. You know, if what's proven, you know, if what I say is proven wrong, then Hey, it's a learning opportunity to figure out what I had wrong and kind of move toward the right direction. And being open to doing that is so huge because, mm-hmm. you know, I am so interested in doing other things besides just spiritual paranormal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really working hard on ufology knowledge because that mm-hmm. fascinates me. These ancient alien mm-hmm. theories that I've been exposed to over the last year or so are blowing me out of the water. I I got to hear Eric Von Donneken about four times this summer, and mm-hmm. that is something that will open your mind because he's the original Indiana Jones, truly. Mm-hmm. And to hear him explain some of the things that he saw, such as how many Nazca lines there really are, and they're all they were all over the sides of the mountains, things of that nature that there's no one else to talk about that was probably my favorite thing. And mm-hmm. there's a whole different way of thinking to what NASA and science and scientists, which are, I'm sorry, anything back beyond maybe a couple of centuries, it's only theory. Mm -hmm. There is not documentation available unless you move into things that the average bear can't translate Mm -hmm. to, to try to show that this stuff's not real, right? Because when the Dead Sea Scrolls came to light, the world changed, and nobody even really knows that. 
But history changed dramatically. Things that were known to be real, you know, air quotes, mm -hmm. were completely mm -hmm. blown away by the information in those scrolls. They did not validate a lot of things, and they brought a lot of other things into the light that nobody expected. So Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think we, we talked about the Mandela effect. Um, oh, that's so bizarre. Last time. And... But you know, um, the, the the thing of it is, do you, do you realize how far out of date even our textbooks are nowadays? Oh please, that absolutely. There's, that there's <laughs> there is so much, um, so so much information in our textbooks these days that is completely wrong, and the problem is, very much what's happening today is the same thing that happened several hundred years ago when um, Gal when Galileo pointed his telescope at the sky and said, you know, maybe we're not the center of the universe. And Oh, and by the way, the whole earth being flat thing, that's not <laughs> right either. You know? Yeah. That, that didn't work um, out for him. Well, at first. Yeah. That, um, you know, here it was, he made a discovery that, you know, we, we accept as, the norm today, well, most of us, there's still a few out there that don't venture too far so they don't fall off. But, you know, mo most of the population today is, could agree that Earth is round. And, um, you know, the, um, the, the thing it is, he, what he put out there was against the scientific law of the day. And for him calling into question what was being accepted as scientific fact, he faced the Inquisition, literally. Yes, totally. And, and you know, nowadays, it you know, if, if a scientist with most universities, if a scientist were to come out and say, you know, the parent, you know, the, the paranormal is real. I figured it out. Ghosts are real. And this is the type of energy form that they're, they're, they're made of. And this is how they communicate. It wouldn't matter how compelling his evidence was. He would be mocked. He would lose his tenure. And if he were able to mirac miraculously retain his job at the university, he would be stuck somewhere as a file clerk in the basement. Well, definitely tenure would be gone. Mm -hmm. But I don't see any way that a professional scholar would be able to survive that professionally. Right. That's, you know, and, and the thing about it is how much information are we getting that is outdated, that is wrong, that a lot of people know is wrong, but we're just not receiving it because people are afraid you know, the, the people who make the discoveries are scared to say anything. Well, and not only they that, know. if you, if somebody has to come forward and say, you know, our bad, we couldn't afford to print new textbooks. So we just didn't change this information because we didn't think the changes would actually be relevant. And plus, we kind of don't want you changing your mindset. Mm -hmm. Then how's that going to work for them as well? There's a lot at stake when you come to the educational materials because it's a great it's a great manipulative manipulative tool to have a certain perspective or other in there. It's just really an interesting concept, but you know what? We are 30 seconds away from our second break. I cannot believe how fast the time goes when we talk. This is just crazy. I know it, it is. <laughs> yep. This is too fast. It is too fast. And I did want to um, say before we go to break that for all of those people who are suffering as a result of Hurricane Michael, just know that y'all are still in our prayers and in our thoughts. All the positives are flowing to you as well as the dollars. And we are... We are doing our best. We are doing our level best to help you. So just know that y'all aren't forgotten. I know it's a couple of weeks out, and I know the media has died down, and when that happens, volunteers tend to go home too. 
we're in here for y'all for the long haul. So that being said, Frank, let's take about two minutes and we'll be right back, okay? Sounds great. All right. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. And just like that, we're back. Hi there. This is Fate Radio, and thank you so much for being here with my guest, Frank Lee. And Frank, I am, I want to continue that conversation we were in the middle of with the, the mm-hmm. textbooks and the educational system really failing our mm-hmm. students because the information they are gleaning is inaccurate. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, the, the thing that is popular ideas that are theories, um, they they aren't um you, you know they aren't put out there hey this is a theory they get put out there as fact right you know and, I hate that. and, and just and, and just to clarify on that you know the theory of relativity the gravitational waves it's only been three years since we actually confirmed that theory of relativity was correct but how many years was it tall forever what let's see this is 2018 at least 75 am i right mm -hmm. roughly so so you know and and i'm gonna say um something you know something else that that i see a lot and and this is you you know we, we may mention of the inquisition Problem is, the Inquisition is still alive and well. It's just yes. no longer labor. It, it's not ran by the church. It's ran by um, pub- the public court of opinion. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I see happening now that is a terrible, terrible path for us to go down is um, politics is taking place, uh, the place that religion used to hold over sides over what's acceptable as fact and what isn't you know you see so much like with with climate change with um vaccinations and all all this it's not a okay let's look at the facts it's okay well you know if you if you agree with this statement you must belong to this party or you don't agree with it well you must belong to this party and that is, you know, that's equally as dangerous as not having that separation of religion and science, you know, and, and I see that so often. 
and it's very frustrating because it doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you're on, there mm -hmm. is always an ox being gored. Mm -hmm. And how you respond to whatever is happening depends on your if it's your ox. Because there mm -hmm. is there is no public discourse anymore. There's no debate. There's no real discussion because, and I'm not, so I'm not picking a side on that because it <clears throat> seems to be very widespread. And I don't think that refusal to answer, I will say that the person that sat in, in the street screaming at the sky right. was an idiot. What were they hoping yeah. to accomplish? I mean, get up and go and have a discussion with someone, create a forum, have, you know, other people join in the discussion, be willing to hear other thought processes and learn to communicate as an adult and realistically. Not everybody's going to you agree. You know, I think it's that okay. is such a major problem these days. It is. Um, you know, People, not, it's exactly like you said, people don't have discussions anymore. They have arguments. And, you know, a major flaw is people don't listen to understand. They listen to reply. Yes. Um, and, you know, you can't have a fruitful, productive conversation if you're not listening to comprehend, okay, well, what, how does this person see it? What is, what is going on? If the only reason you're listening is knowing, Hey, I've got this good argument point that I can throw in right here, then waste your time. And we don't see enough of that. You know, nowadays it's like people put their ego too much out front and they put things, just ideas. Um, they, they hold them as personally invested, you know, string theory, for instance, you know, oh. the string. Mm, yes. <laughs> I, 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 you, you know how I feel about string theory. I love string theory. I hope that that's the one because I just love the way it operates. I do too. But, but you know, it might be wrong. But, but well, there's, however, but there's parts I'm not of it going I don't to understand. have a heated Right. Now, well, see, like with me, I'm not going to have a heated debate and um, throw personal insults and things like that into someone over string theory. Why? Because it's not – I'm not the person who's thought of it. it um, granted, as, as much as I like that theory, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. And that's something I don't know. And I only wish that I'd been a fraction as smart as the – people responsible for putting it together. But I'm not personally invested in it. And, you know, so you're not going to hurt my feelings if you say, you know, that, that theory is wrong. Well, that's not I don't always, have that mm, that's not quite true. That might hurt your feelings. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it, it would hurt my feelings a little because I really like the way it's laid out. But I know. But nothing I wouldn't get over. <laughs> right. Well, you know, my problem with that is residual activity. Mm -hmm. Because I I absolutely, yeah, I, I told you that when I went and saw that movie, um, uh, Interstellar, that mm -hmm. was my aha moment on grasping string theory. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds simplistic, but I was having trouble wrapping my mind around a couple of different aspects. And when I saw that movie, I was just I'm in the middle of a crowded theater. I was like, that's string theory. Got it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I was asked to leave and not come back. Not really. They didn't tell me to leave. But I got it there. And mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful, except that if the, if the crossing of, you know, if, the, if the strings coming together and something popping out is mm -hmm. what paranormal experiences are, then mm -hmm. I think that residual hauntings or experiences are the the thing that 
makes me go hum relevant to that. You know, maybe it's the exception that proves the rule. I don't know. But I just find that to be an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you have to consider that the reason we call it paranormal is because it's the glitches. It's the things that aren't supposed to happen, aren't supposed to be. We don't have the understanding of the universe yet to explain why these things happen. And granted, in 100 years, it might not be paranormal. You know, 100 years from now, we might completely understand it and it be taught in a middle school textbook. But um, the, the big thing about it is everything all-encompassing of the paranormal is those glitches. It is that side effect of the popping. Yes. And, and so what, what happens, that, I'm so glad that you use that analogy because, you know, people forget you can't understand the side effect, the byproduct of that popping if you don't understand the main process. You're right. You have to, I, I can't, I can't explain fire to, or I can't explain smoke to you if you don't understand how fire works. That's true. And, and that's what a lot of people are doing in, in the paranormal, unfortunately, is they're not educating themselves. They're not trying to reach those, the basic understandings and what happens with, um, you know, okay, we, we have this biological occurrence, this geomagnetic occurrence, this, you know, these basic physical science, basic biology, those things that we all need to be familiar with. If we don't understand what those processes are, how they work, what they're capable of, then everything is going to be paranormal because we're not going to personally have the understanding or comprehension to explain it and say, oh, no, that's just this. You're right. We have these discussions all the time relevant to mm -hmm. the different theories and the different applications of them. But I just really love, I really love string also. I just think mm -hmm. that I think that it is going to be proven at some point. I don't know which generation is going to find the methodology to do that. I think that, mm -hmm. yeah, you had mentioned the mandala effect. And if you're going to mm -hmm. talk about glitches and hiccups in the string theory or the residual effects, then I think that that can fall into that realm. Don't you? Because Absolutely. Because it's something that, that you just don't understand, but it's, I don't care what people say, there are instances. And I've mm -hmm. experienced some of them. So mm -hmm. I just find that to be a very interesting thing. And I don't care how many times somebody tries to tell me that what I know and personally experienced didn't really happen. It did. I personally experienced mm -hmm. some of the things that they say are, you know, didn't occur. And I don't know why they do these things. They being whoever is trying to protect the public from a panic. That's what I think the issue is. Because, you know, mm -hmm. War of the Worlds was a test and we failed it. <laughs> I mean, you know. Oh, miserably. The first broadcast, I really believe, was a test on, you know, whether we were going to be told that aliens are the real thing. And as a society, it failed miserably. Mm-hmm. So. It, um, you know, to, um, you know, the, can, can you imagine, you know, if, if so much of this information that these professors have been teaching for years, these researchers have built their whole career around one particular theory or idea or discovery, um, and here it is, you come along and you say, you know, that's wrong. Here, I can prove it. How well do you think that's going to go over? Well, I don't think anybody else would hear from you again if it was the right academic. Right. They would not hear your theory or your proof. No. And, 
And that would be the easiest way for your credibility to disappear, your tenure to disappear, your income to disappear, if you yourself don't disappear. And I, I believe that a lot of that happens. I believe it does too. I really do. So that, um, you know, that that's the big that that's the big thing is it. In order for there to really be a change, for us to get a lot of true information, for one, um, the the people relaying the information are going to have to give up the political bias. You know, it doesn't matter which side a news agency or any type of informational source. Um, it, it doesn't matter which side they claim is their affiliation. If I see them endorse a candidate or endorse a party or whatever, that's the last that I ever follow. Yes. Because, because that I know that what I get isn't from, isn't going to be true actuality. It's going to be skewed to support an idea. You're and right. once you once you put that claim out there, we support this, then that tells me, well, this that goes, you know, this information here that goes against what you're supporting isn't going to be published. And it might be something I need to know. Um, and and I don't care who it is they support, you know, if they're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, it don't matter it, if they when they say we support this, we do this, they're saying we're biased and lean this way. Yes. And so few people the same, understand that. Mm-hmm. That, well, you know, that's the same as on investigations. You know, the, the silent ghost box experiment uh, that we do, mm-hmm. um, that is the reason that I do that, is I don't want the answer that we receive to be biased because if I ask the question, if I say, what's your favorite color? Then I'm automatically listening for a color mm-hmm. and anything that comes through that sounds even remotely similar. My mind's already making up, uh, you know, or preparing for that response when what, we actually get might have nothing whatsoever to, to do with the question that I asked. Um, and, um, the, um, that's, that's the same way our information needs to be. And, um, you know, that I don't even trust. That's why I, I do that experience. I, I don't even trust myself to not be biased. You well, know, I don't want to have that subconscious bias that affects the, the outcome of my investigation. We all have that, though, and that's why it's imperative that you find methodologies to remove that where you can, like you have with the with that experiment, which worked brilliantly, well, you know, by the way. Oh, yeah, I, I, was, I was pleased with it. Um, you know, something that we have to do is... First off, we have to realize no matter how much we want to believe something, um, one, our, um, we are, you know, nobody is perfect. We are humans. We will make mistakes. We will get information wrong. We can have, un, you know, we, we can subconsciously have bias toward one result or another. And we cannot trust our minds half as much as we think we can. I, I think half is being generous. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, that's something that people fail to realize. And that's a lot of the reason why I lean more toward the skeptical side of paranormal research is, you know, it doesn't matter how sensational it is. Yes, a um, a personal experience can be very useful information when when you're dealing with paranormal activity, but personal experience, no matter who experienced, whether it's somebody on the team or a client, it doesn't matter, is not 
and will never constitute proof of the paranormal. Oh, no. Because depending because, on the day, mm -hmm. there are health issues, there are mental health issues. There's, am I having a bad day and I'm just seeking, you know, comfort from something, right? What else would you apply mm -hmm. to that? Well, you know, our perception that there are two different things that that are two things that are completely different are reality and our own perception of reality. And just because we see something that is, um, you know, very convincing to us, we swear we heard this, we saw this, we felt this, that doesn't mean it's entirely true. I mean, watch any magician for one minute, and you'll see how easily our eyes can be fooled, our ears can be fooled. We, you know, there's a lot of information that our brains miss and it likes to fill in the gaps however it can. Yes, that's true. And, and we have to be aware of that as investigators. We have to be willing to accept, hey, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm not seeing this right. Maybe I'm not hearing this right. And we, we can't be afraid to ask someone who might not agree with us, what do you see? What are you hearing? Well, we do that, but you know what? We are into the top of the hour. We've got a little news break coming up, and for everyone who is listening, thank you so much. I hope you've loved this first hour because, trust me, the second one's going to fly too, but we will be back, and I hope you catch a little good news in here today. Support for NPR and the following message come from PBS, presenting The Facebook Dilemma, a frontline investigation into Facebook's impact on privacy and democracy that asks whether it's uniting or dividing us. Tune in or stream starting Monday, October 29th at 9 on PBS. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Louise Schiavone. A caravan of about 5,000 Central American migrants is making its way through southern Mexico. Their destination today is Tapachula, Mexico. From there, they will continue north to the U.S. border. Reporter Emily Green has been traveling with them. The caravan took off at 5 a.m. from the southern Mexican border. Many of the migrants had been walking over the last week from Honduras, although others were already in Mexico. Their goal was to make it 20 miles north to Tapachula. By 10 a.m., it was swelteringly hot. Still, the thousands of migrants continued forward. Moms breastfed their babies as they walked. Dads pushed strollers. Three-year-olds put one foot in front of the other, despite utter exhaustion. Leila Poala was walking with her five-year-old daughter. She and her family have been traveling for three days from Honduras. She says she wants to reach the United States, God willing. But if not, she will stay in Mexico and work. For NPR News, I'm Emily Green in Tapachula, Mexico. European leaders are calling the killing of Jamal Khashoggi shocking and a violation of international law. Terry Schultz reports the governments of Britain, France, and Germany warned that efforts to clarify the death so far are not credible. European Union Foreign Policy Chief Federica Mogherini calls the circumstances of Khashoggi's death deeply troubling and a violation of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which requires obeying the laws of the host country. Mogherini says the EU insists on the need for a thorough, credible, and transparent investigation and accountability for those responsible. In a joint statement, Britain, France, and Germany say the explanations given by the Saudi government would need to be backed up by facts to be credible. They also suggest their future relationship with Riyadh is on the line, saying decisions will be made based on the explanations they receive about the killing and, quote, our confidence that such a shameful event cannot and will not ever be repeated. For NPR News, I'm Terry Schultz in Brussels. Iraqi leaders have signed on to a lucrative arrangement with General Electric and the German company Siemens to develop Iraq's power infrastructure. This after intense maneuvering 
NPR's Shannon Van Sant reports. Siemens had been the frontrunner for a reported $15 billion deal with Iraq to supply the country with power generation equipment. But after pressure from the Trump administration, Iraq's government may give some of the work to U.S.-based GE. According to Bloomberg News and the Financial Times, U.S. officials warned Iraq's prime minister not to move forward with Siemens and that if he did so, U.S.-Iraq relations would be at risk. Alongside the GE deal, the U.S. has also reportedly signed a broader agreement to help Iraq build out its energy sector and make the country energy independent. Shannon Van Sant, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR News. In Afghanistan, 11 civilians have died in a roadside bomb blast. Jennifer Glass reports that IEDs are one of the leading killers in Afghanistan. The family was traveling in a station wagon near Achin, a district that borders Pakistan, when their car struck a bomb planted in the road. All 11, including six children, were killed. These kinds of explosives take the lives of a 1,000 Afghan civilians each year and have been condemned by the UN because they are indiscriminate. No one has claimed responsibility for the blast. The area in eastern Angkar province is home to both Taliban and Islamic State fighters. While the bomb may have been planted for military vehicles, as so often happens here, ordinary Afghans were the ones killed. For NPR News, I'm Jennifer Glass in Kabul. The U.S.-led coalition fighting Islamic State forces struck a mosque in Syria. A coalition statement reported the strike crushed an insurgent command and control center, killing a dozen fighters. The coalition stated that while the law of war protects mosques, the use of the mosque as a military command center nullified its protected status. The attack was reported by local media. Charles Wang, a technology company founder and former owner of the New York Islanders hockey team, has died. He was 74. Wang founded Computer Associates International in 1976. He bought the team with a partner for $190 million. Before that, he'd never been to a hockey game. Two years ago, Wang sold most of his interest in the Islanders. I'm Luis Schiavone, NPR News, Washington. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Welcome back to Fate Magazine Radio. When someone is having a glitch in the matrix, as it were, they start to get really panicked. And Mm -hmm. everything appears to be frightening and paranormal, right? That's when we get the calls. Right. Well, you know, the the big thing is the paranormal is not... It's kind of like we're talking about earlier you know there there's the normal process of things there's our as an individual we we each have our own level of understanding and comprehension of how the world works around us um the paranormal is something that is a glitch outside of that normal operation or at least outside of our comprehension of it and You know, there there are a couple of different reactions that we can take. You know, we can take a logical approach to it. We can take a problem-solving approach, or we can go into full-on panic mode. And, um, you know, that's uh, something we have to remember, though. It It is a glitch that we're trying to track down when we're talking about paranormal occurrences. Um, The thing about glitches is is A plus B doesn't always equal C. Um, We can't predict when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And, um, you you know, that's uh, and that's something that that we have to be willing to understand. And we have to keep in mind that the paranormal is unknown. So just because we think we have an idea of what it is doesn't mean that we're right. You know, for instance, that reminds me of a case that that we worked here um, just a few years ago that um, 
four paranormal, we, or excuse me, three paranormal teams had went in before us and investigated. We were the fourth team going in. The three teams that went in ahead of us had told this family, you're going to have to move. You've got this negative entity attached to you, and it's attached to this property. And one, I think one of them told them that he needed an exorcism, and they hadn't had done exorcisms. They had done house cleansings. They had, they had done all of this stuff that, you know, had – the, the the poor guy was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. He was well, terrified. Of course he was. You know what it ended up being uh, when we investigated? Uh, it was his fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Nothing paranormal at all going on there. It was an infrasound frequency put up from his um, air filter for the fish tank vibrating against the wall. And um, it, it was putting out an infrasound frequency that was affecting everybody in the house. Um, after we corrected the positioning of the, of the um, air filter and, um, you know, set that right, all of a sudden all of the ghosts were gone and he didn't need to move, he didn't need an exorcism. Um, you know, and, and that kind of correlates back to our comprehension of the world around us and how it works. Um, you know, because it's so easy when we don't understand something to panic, to jump to conclusions, and we that's something we can't do. We set ourselves up for failure when we do that. Every time. Um, yes, that... Uh, it's something that, uh, you, you know, that's just a dangerous reaction to have. But, you know, a lot of people say the most primal fear in humans is fear of the dark. But that's not exactly accurate. The most primal fear in humans is the fear of the unknown. Which is why we're afraid of the dark is because what's in the dark, we don't know. Exactly. You know, it's one of those things that I heard someone say that was what their dad had taught them. When they would ask mm -hmm. if he was afraid of anything or if he was afraid of the dark, how could he, you know, why did he lock the door and do all these other things? And he told them that he wasn't afraid of the dark. He was afraid of what he could not see in the dark. Mm -hmm. I, the same analogy. I just, mm -hmm. I find that interesting because... I'm not generally afraid of being alone or being in the dark or anything like that. My worst nightmare are snakes. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, if there were a snake in the dark, well, then I would be afraid of the dark. But it's right. it's just really fascinating how this human psyche works with that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. Um, you know, so many people... In, and the paranormal are they, they are you, they're caught up in tunnel vision and they are all focused on dead people the you know ghosts dead people you know oh well let's go to this place because a lot of people died there so it must be haunted or that place is old and abandoned it must be haunted or let's go to the graveyard because god knows graveyards are crazy haunted which is all nonsensical and um i, I mean but just just speaking of uh, of graveyards, I mean seriously, why would you stick around <laughs> in a graveyard? Um, I don't understand that know. either because there's no logical reason unless mm -hmm. unless you told somebody you would meet them there or something. I don't know. Right. That. Um, yeah. You, you know. There, there's so people get so fix, fixated on dead people, creepy things, scary things, and they forget that the paranormal is not like watching a Hollywood horror movie or a TV show. And matter of fact, what most people I, I mentioned tunnel vision because so very little of the paranormal 
actually involves dead people. True. That so, so much more of the paranormal is directly linked to living people. But yet, a lot of people in the paranormal forget about the living people. They're focused on um, the the dead people, home, where a lot of people died, and, you know, all this. And, you, you know, you had to think about it. One, one of the craziest things that, that I see teams do is these people will say, you know, every night, you know, it it might be the wife that calls us, you know. You, usually the men don't call us, you know. Usually it's the wife because, you know, the husband's not going to talk about it to anybody most of the time. Uh, and and they, they'll call us up and they'll say um, that, um, you know, every time it's just, you know, the kids are, when the, when the kids leave, it's just me and my husband sitting here. At um, about four every evening, this happens. So most teams, you know, out there that that you see, especially the TV types, they they say, "Oh well, great! I'll tell you what, we're gonna come out about midnight. We're gonna um, have you and your husband leave, and we we're just gonna check out the house and see what happens." Well, what's wrong with that picture? Um, they're saying when certain people are there. At a certain time, a certain event happens. So you're going to toss out every single thing that has happened at the exact uh, at and try to get rid of the people who could very well be the trigger. If if it's happening when they're you know when person A is there at this specific time and under these specific conditions then guess what you need to recreate that as close as you can to observe it absolutely you do and people just don't do that i don't understand mm -hmm. that either right i mean that it would be the same as as you know going up and saying hey check out this really cool gadget i've got it works great now here let me take the batteries out but i want you to see how it works <laughs> Well, I have tried to test a piece so, of equipment with no batteries, and, um, so I feel that. It's just crazy. I didn't realize it. Not, I'm not that crazy. I didn't realize the batteries weren't in it. Somebody had handed it to me. It was embarrassing. Well, goodness gracious, what on earth has happened here? Hello there. Well, hello. I, I apologize for that. That was the connection on my end. Oh, okay. So well, maybe there are gremlins running around rampant. Right. That. Um, yeah. The the bad thing about where I live is my our internet service out here is terrible. So had to um, get off of it and switch over to the sailor, and now we are good to go. Fantastic. I think that is just an interesting thing. And we have our haunted spirit guide in chat. We were talking about the, possibly the land being haunted as opposed to the homes or mm -hmm. the individuals, which would take us back to stone tape and right. other things of that nature. And talking about cemeteries being built on some haunted locations, perhaps, ground that was already tainted. And Southern mm -hmm. Spirit Guide, our friend you know, said at least some of the haunted mm -hmm. cemeteries that he's encountered in his research seem to be haunted because they had been disturbed. What mm -hmm. say you? Well, you know, that that is very good. Um, that and, and by the way... It, Anybody that, if you're not checking out, I, I finally got to be in Lewis for the first time last night during the investigation. I didn't know that was your first time. That, well, we, you know, we talked a little bit over, over the internet, but that was the first time actually getting to meet Lewis in person. Super great guy. Go, uh, you know, go check out Southern Spirit Guy. It, it, you know, some of the, the stuff that he writes, puts out there, it, it's awesome. Um, so, so definitely go. Go check him out. Tell him Frank sent you. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, but you know, I absolutely believe that um, 
yes, a cemetery, um, I, I do think that does happen that, you know, maybe they're established on ground that's already haunted for, for various reasons. But that is a very good point that he puts up um, about um, it being disturbed. You know, you you have to to think about it. When when do you hear so many reports of activity happening? When you know people say, "Well, yeah, this house is about sixty years old. Nobody's ever had anything happen in here." Oh, we moved in, um, and all of a sudden things are going crazy. And when you talk to the people, well, you find out what's the first thing that people usually do when they buy a place and move in. They start Renovating. renovating they start customizing it and they create this disturbance well you know and, and it's kind of like i'd mentioned earlier you know about people thinking just because a place is old or abandoned that it must be haunted when you know i can't tell you how many times i've ran into a place that was brand new first people that had moved in uh hadn't been there but just a couple months and Nothing ever happened, no kind of history there, but they move in and the house is on it. Um, and what do both of those scenarios have in common is there's a disturbance. There is something, it, it's like the potential energy has always been there, but it was at rest. You know, it's just like a, a circuit with, you know, you, you have that battery plugged up, it's charged up, it's ready to go, but nothing's happening on happening until something comes through and moves that switch over that's right to initiate it and i think it's very much the same with a lot of the haunted locations um you know i i think a lot of times it gets down to a level of just pure and simple um the the geology of of certain ground has more potential to store energy. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm not talking about like psychic energy or anything like that. I mean, literal energy with our, which our minds operate off of, which, um, you know, there, there's so many ways that we are connected with biological energy that we don't really think about. But when you have any kind of disturbance, yes, it can trigger ripples so to speak I'm um, interrupt you. Mm -hmm. so we're going to be gone for about three and we will be right back and don't forget we have brenda's question for frank to answer too so this is going to be good oh oh yeah
You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Welcome back to Fate Magazine Radio, and we are here with my friend, Frank Lee, who is one of the most brilliant paranormal researchers that I know, or have really ever met. When it comes to the technical side, there's no one better. And when it comes to the creativity of experiments to do to test theories that he comes up with, again, no one more brilliant. I, I have to say that Brandon Smith, who is with the Tennessee Wraith Chasers, is pretty close. Y'all run kind of neck and neck. He's pretty smart, too. But I, I told him about you, and he was like, oh, wow. So you may be getting a, an email soon. But I do want to ask you Brenda's question because she has been waiting patiently through all these things. Are you up for it? Sure thing, absolutely. Are you a little afraid? Uh, well, well, you know that. Uh, <laughs> with, with it coming from Brenda, I, I, I'm definitely going to be a little nervous, but 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 there's no way that I can let her down. So so go ahead and fire it at me. Thank you, Dick. It's actually a really good question, and we haven't even approached it yet in this conversation. But she would like to know what was the first thing that ran its creepy, cold fingers down your spine and made you a believer in the possibility of paranormal activity and got you started in your research? Well, you know, I, I was always curious about things. This goes back um, as far as I can remember. You know, and I even had a near-death experience when I was a child, um, which is really where it started. Um, when when I was about six years old, I, um, I had been put in the hospital for a relatively minor procedure, and I had an adverse reaction to the anesthesia. Um, as a result of that, I was actually flatlined for right at six and a half minutes. I mean, they um, you know they they were about ready to give up on me. Um, the um, the thing about it is with which that's kind of a common occurrence, but I remember um, I could account for the time while I was flatlined. I knew everything that happened that was said, and I remember there even being other people in the room that shouldn't have been there. They weren't dressed up in medical clothing or didn't even look like they were from this time period. Um, I, I can remember, um, and, and it kind of freaked everyone out when there was six years old and, you know, I was talking about, I was describing in detail, you know, them, it, it was the fourth time that they tried resuscitating me that they finally got my heart going again. Um, you know, and describing that and, you know, the, the doctor after the third time didn't work. Um, saying, you know, it, we've lost him, and, and the nurse saying, no, I know his family, we can't, let's try one more time. Um, the, that whole experience was what made me think, you know, okay, there's a, a lot out there that I don't know. And I mean, even though I was extremely young, that sparked my curiosity. And from then on, it affected me. You know, I remember being in second, third grade, you know, all the other kids are reading Clifford the Big Red Dog and um, all this stuff. And I'm reading scary stories to tell in the dark and mystery of Easter Island and <laughs> Bermuda Triangle and UFOs. And, um, and that's kind of how it, Absolutely. Um, they, um, that, that's how it all kind of started um 
when when I got a little older, when when I got to be about fifteen, I started really researching more into it. Um, I remember I was 15 years old when I read ESP Hauntings and Poltergeist by Lloyd Arbach. That, that book is, if you have not read that book, then right after this show is over, order that book. Don't, don't even get up from the computer. If you're listening at the computer, go ahead. If you're listening on your phone, go ahead and, you know, type it in there. That, but get ESP Hauntings and Poltergeist by Lloyd Arbach. That when, but because you know, e- even at the at that young of an age, I, there there were a lot of things I just didn't believe very easily. And you know, I remember being fifteen, reading that book, and it's like, whoa, this clicks. Because I always loved science. I always had that fascination, and here it was finally something was making the two start to kind of connect and um you know so so after that i started reading every kind of book i could get my hands on you know by michael persinger um barry taff um lloyd arbach by william roll all, all these amazing authors that have done so much work and that sadly a lot of people weren't familiar with um and I did that for several years. Um, I, I read and studied the heck out of it, but it never went out and investigated. Till finally, when I was 21, I remember going out, and that was my first investigation. And I'm thankful at the time that me and my buddies that went that went out with me when we decided we we're gonna have our little team. I'm, I'm kind of thankful that back in those days that camcorders were so ridiculously expensive that we couldn't afford one yet because uh, I remember I was, we're we're walking through this cemetery. I was terrified. I'm not going to lie. There I was just, you know, young, dumb kid. Didn't know what I was doing. Never done an investigation before. Didn't know what to expect. Walking through the middle of the cemetery at night with my little micro cassette recorder I picked up for 20 bucks at Radio Shack. And um, I, I remember something caught my attention. And when it, when it did, I, I turned around really fast. And I felt claws all of a sudden going down my back. And I just knew at that moment, I thought, well, so this is how I die. I'm here in the middle of the graveyard. That's where they're going to find me. I thought some had done, came up and got me. So I spun around really fast and um, to, you know, try and see what it was that was killing me before I died, I guess. Um, and and when I did, I tripped over, it, it was so funny, I tripped over a tombstone that was behind me, just about did a somersault, came within a few inches of cracking my head open on the tombstone behind that, all because this this um, demon, as I thought it was at the time, turned out to be just a dogwood tree with a low-hanging limb. <laughs> so there's this whole... I'm sorry, that you know, visual is just fantastic oh, yeah. because I can't imagine you reacting like that now. I, I know that that's the thing is, you know, that I, I definitely didn't start off being this calm and collected and... <laughs> You know, uh, I'm just so thankful that nobody has that on video. Um, But, um, you know, I remember, though, after that whole experience, the the laughing afterward, you know, we're going back. We're listening to everything that was recorded. And on my little micro cassette recorder, I had one EVP from that night. And it was a male voice that said, hey. I'm here. And that was it. Three words. Just letting you know. And when that happened, when first investigation, that's like, like I say, you know, one EVP, just three little words. Hey, I'm here. And that was all it took. I was hooked and I've been doing it ever since. Well, you had your questions answered in that one sentence. 
Absolutely. So, I mean, despite, you know, running into having an encounter with a demonic dogwood tree that tried to kill me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually dogwood trees are symbols of good, right? Very rarely that one was will you cool. find a demonic dogwood tree. Right, that that one tried to kill me. I, I, I see that. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that that's one of those things that, you know, and, and I don't think, had that been my second or third um, investigation or whatever, I don't think that experience would have stuck with me as much. But that being the first time ever went out and done it, uh, I think that, that really <laughs> just ingrained it that much more into my brain. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's no way that it could not have done that. You know, the first time I was ever leading an investigation, I got my very first ever Class A EVP too. But it mm -hmm. wasn't that cool. It was just, I was trying to work a camcorder because I had just gotten it and had no idea exactly what I was doing. And Mm -hmm. It was all women on the site, and it was a man who said, so, are we recording now? And it was just, <laughs> what the heck? So, you know, I was already interested, but that's fascinating, because that truly was your your answer to the whole reason that you were even there. Mm-hmm. So and, 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 you know, it, it's like I say, that, that was all it took. And, you know, here it is 19 years later, and, you know, I'm still doing it and still just as curious. But, you know, it's funny. Uh, the, the more that I learn, the more I realize that I don't know. Um, you know, but... A very smart person one time said that um, the way that you know you're doing proper research is when you is not finding the right answers, but asking the right questions. And I think that's what we have to do is we we have to make sure that we are asking the right questions. You know what? You know, like I was saying earlier, the, the paranormal has a lot more to do with living people than it does dead people. I mean, by just a ridiculous margin. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, not, you know, are ghosts just dead people that are lingering around? But let me ask, what, how is that possible for human consciousness to stick around? after the body dies how you know how is a living person capable of imprinting a moment of their life into their environment so strongly that 50 100 200 years later is still replays in time you know it's that's kind of the the way that we have to look at it and, you know, don't be afraid to, to challenge the old ideas, the old beliefs and superstitions. And, you know, a lot of the things that we encounter in the paranormal are purely from old superstitions that predate, um, you know, this millennium or the last millennium, I should say. So, you know, we, we have to, to be willing to question everything. And yet people are so willing not to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's giving up, it's giving up your ideas. It's not allowing <clears throat> what matters to you to come through. And right. I think that's tragic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, you know, when, when you pick a set ideology that you, you refuse to accept anything outside of, all you're doing is you're putting yourself into a box and limiting yourself. 
um, you know, you, you have to think about it. What if nobody ever said, I wonder if the Earth really is flat? Or, or what? Well, what if nobody ever asked the question, are we really the center of the universe? Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, but I'm teasing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, you know, there's still a lot of people out there that kind of, you know, that, um, think that they're the, that, you know, the center of the universe involves them and they're not talking about the planet that they're on. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that that's the thing is look at how many things that we um we encounter on a daily basis that we just take for granted that we wouldn't have if no one had ever questioned it. No one had ever been willing to think outside that box and say, you know, I don't think this is right. You know, you, you have to consider, you know, it hasn't been, but just, you know, barely a hundred and, uh, about 150 years ago that if you had leukemia, if you had epilepsy, if, you know, anything that triggered a seizure, that when you went into that seizure, you didn't go to a doctor. You went to a priest to get an exorcism because obviously it was a demon possessing your body. What if nobody had ever challenged that? There's some parts of the country that I would say very few people do challenge that. Mm -hmm. And we well, see sure. the results of that, which are tragic. Mm -hmm. so yes. I just think you know, and, really yes. Tragic. Uh, yeah, but, you know, that that really is a dangerous mindset to get into where where we're not willing to accept any new ideas, any anything that challenges our current beliefs that and it doesn't matter if you're science, politics, paranormal, diet, exercise or to anything you want to talk about. It's that's a terrible mindset to have. And um, it, um, you know, th that's how we grow. You no no matter what you're doing you don't grow inside your comfort zone. You know, it's only when you push those limits, get yourself out and make yourself uncomfortable, <laughs> tread that new territory that, that you really learn and, and yes. grow and develop. I laugh because that's so true. You know, You've had this experience <laughs> very recently. Very recently. <laughs> it seems like it was just moments ago, but <gasps> Yeah, you know, in all seriousness, that's when skills start to develop also. If you are mm -hmm. aware of your environment, if you're sensitive to energies, if you know things that you don't feel you should, if you recognize situations you've never been in, you have to mm -hmm. step out of what is considered the real world, okay? And if you don't ever do that, then you never grow to develop those particular skills either. And I think that if you have those skills, they are designed simply to help others through your protection as well. But you have them to help others. And mm -hmm. if you don't develop them, then you're, you're really not doing your job with what they were physically designed, you know, given to you for. I, I feel mm -hmm. that. And, you know, the, the technical side, you know, that's just a thing. That's, things don't always work the way you anticipate that they will. And that's, that's the biggest learning curve I've had on that part of it. But, oh, yeah. you know, I think that, that what you're saying is fascinating and so true, such a reality. I want to share something with you from our chat room. That mm -hmm. was just posted because I know this is a theory of yours. And mm -hmm. it's supported here by Shelly, who actually owns a haunted location. She is our Friday night host. She is a brilliant person and researcher in her own right. I know that you've heard mm -hmm. me talk about the old Paulding jail and my experiences oh, there. Oh, yes. Okay, that, is, that's actually somewhere that's on my bucket list of places to check out. I just haven't had a chance to get up there and check it out yet. Well, I'm going in the spring. We need to coordinate that. But um, Definitely. Shelly actually says that she is finding that some of the old school talks, old school thoughts don't fit. The storms, for example, are said by 
everyone, activity amps up during them. She's finding she's finding this to not always be true. And as far as cold spots go, she is finding this is your part. She is finding mm -hmm. that energy is also leaving heat stamps. So mm -hmm. you feel that the cold you feel that when you have a cold spot it's when something has already departed as a rule. So right. do you feel like when there are warm spots or hot heat spots that that's and I have a thought after this that I want you to comment on too that the heat spots mm -hmm. may be where the actual activity is occurring at that time and when we were doing our investigation this weekend mm -hmm. I was filming um, an area and it was so crazy because there was something else very active happening behind me that was familial com communication behind me and then somebody was using a uh, fleur seek looking in mirrors and picture frames and such there was it wasn't cold spots it, they were hot spots and mm -hmm. I'm sitting there filming that saying this is not this is not paranormal activity this has to be where someone touched you know, these glass frames or these walls or something. And one of them raised its hand and waved at us. And I caught that on my camera. And it's in my live feed on Facebook. But the live feed was so glitchy because of all this stuff that was happening around me. It's just insane. People thought that it had stopped and it, it paused a lot through that video and I have not gone back to review it yet but what do you think I know that you think that when you find a cold spot the spirit has already come and gone what do you think about these hot spots because in those mirrors were were red and yellow They're, they weren't blue and I looked over my shoulder at the people behind me they were not doing anything that would indicate that it was somebody playing a prank Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that a lot of it, you know, I I believe that usually the heat dissipation is uh, okay. You know, uh, when when you get down to to the laws of thermodynamics, um, at, at the at the very basic level, when energy is is used, it creates one of two types of reactions either an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction, meaning either the process causes the molecules to lose heat or to produce heat. Typically, um, when, um, when you have a, something that's based more on molecular friction, you have heat being produced, more of your intense um, types of energy transfers. And um, I believe that when, when that heat is burned up as in an exothermic reaction, I, I think what happens is some type of manifestation or something, some interaction takes place it burn. It actually uses the heat as the fuel and cools down quickly right afterward, and that's where our cold spot comes from. The hot spots. It's a little bit more tricky. That's something that I, I'm a, I'm fascinated by. You know, because hot the the hot spots are a lot more rare, but we do see them, and I think that what it is is. I think that you're going to find more of an intelligent reaction related to those hot spots, whereas the cool spots is probably going to tend to be more of like a place memory or more residual. Now, I'm not saying that's absolute by any means, but I think that most of the time, just from what we've seen and observed, uh, that seems to be that something about your intelligent entities tend to produce heat instead of dissipating it. That's interesting. Um, which, which what that kind of tells you is 
based on that observation, that tells you that a um, an apparition that you see or hear that is residual is composed of a different type of energy or fueled by a different type of energy than something that is intelligent. But think of this, what, what else produces heat? Electricity, right. the, the, the flow of electricity, um, specifically the electrons moving through a conductor cause friction on the conductor itself produces heat. Even if it's not detectable by touch, you can measure the temperature difference. Uh, and you can't have a wonder, is that them trying, is that an intelligent entity trying to manifest, trying to move something, trying to create some, some type of psychokinetic reaction that, and that conducting of that energy producing that heat. That's, you know, definitely there, there are so many more questions and answers there, but I think that that's the direction that, that we're going to end up going with it. I do too. And it feels right, if that makes sense. I just find mm -hmm. the, in the instance of the old Paulding jail, that would mm -hmm. be intelligent activity based mm -hmm. on my experiences there because they interact, they're aware of the situations mm -hmm. around them, and they mm -hmm. communicate. So I am convinced that there is active, intelligent activity happening there. Mm -hmm. I just find it fascinating when the stuff just shows up and like, like Friday night when there's everything happening and then you have you know, stuff happening behind us but there's also people in glass who look like heat you know they look like living people because they're heat waving at you it was the darnest mm -hmm. thing I've ever seen it really blew my mind but I know what I know what I've experienced at at Bonding Jail so mm -hmm. And I can't wait for you to experience that. We're going to take and our that place. Go ahead. What? And that oh, place. I was just going to say it's it, it's on my bucket list for sure. Uh, I've always heard good things about it. Well, you're going to love it. But we're going to take a two minute break, right quick, and that way we'll wrap up this business and we will get everything grooving. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. 
Welcome back to Fate Magazine Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Frank Lee, who is my very favorite person to explain scientific theories to me that I might be struggling with a little bit. I share some things with him, too, so it's a good balance. Welcome back, Frank. Are you ready for this last few minutes? Because, oh my gosh, we're not even close uh, to filling out the the whole list of things we had to talk about. Uh, oh, wow. That just a few minutes? Uh, we haven't even got started. I know, right? And that's even oh, with that. all of the, the little hiccups here and there. Right. So, so what we're going to need everybody to do is, you know, here in a few minutes, um, we'll just go to break instead of ending the show. Um, we'll take like a five minute break, go get some coffee, everything. And we'll, we'll just do a marathon show. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go till I don't know what, five, six in the morning. That sounds good. We have good? done that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Not live on the air, but we have done that. We have done. Right. Did we do a four hour show one night? I know we did a three hour show. Did I we think actually so. make yes, four we hours did. one night? Yeah. I we, so. we did. We did. That was just a few months ago. It was. And it was astounding. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of fun. For, yes, yes. We... <laughs> for those that don't that... know us, um, we tend to share a lot of theories and debate a lot of of theory as well. And mm-hmm. I'm I am a researcher, and I'm very dedicated with my research. However, I tend to come at things from the spiritual side. And get confirmation of what I experience, hopefully, by using science mm-hmm. and technology. Because I feel like I can't present what I get from an investigation without having backup. Because it's just mm-hmm. wrong. I can't tell someone, well, I feel like your Aunt Jane, you do have one, right? Is living in this house with you, blah, 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 blah. And I need something else that's going to be substantial for them. And you work from the science side of going with Aunt Jane, Mm -hmm. not necessarily being there, but trying to ascertain if there actually is something happening. And then you might decide it's Aunt Jane. Right, right. As long as it's truly Aunt Jane and not the fish tank. (laughs) (laughs) I think that, um, I think that's going to be awesome. Yes, yes. That um, you I know, I think the fish tank is hilarious. To be quite honest, yes, yes, you know, and the sad thing is, there are three paranormal teams before we went out there that had went out there, and and none of them just thought to check. Hey, what what about the resonant frequencies and sounds that are here? How many Have people we do all- you know that carry that equipment with them? And honestly, you know, uh, it's very few, uh, right. and it's it's even more disheartening when when I say um, when when I mention something about infrasound, how many paranormal investigators that have been doing it for a long time go? What is that? It's just you it blows my mind too. You know the th- the thing that it's like we we're talking about before the the results of your investigation are always going to be directly correlated to your comprehension of the world around you, how things work so that you can recognize when something is outside the ordinary or when something's just a little strange. And we, um, you know, we, we have to do that as if, you know, and, and I think that is a huge holdup that we see in the paranormal field. You know, as when people try to mimic what they see on TV, when when they try to go about things from that angle, or you know, they they go to the to the side of superstition or mythology, and and don't really try to put a logical approach to it. You know, if a TV crew comes out there, who are they going to point a camera at? 
the guy that's over there working on the math problem or the clown in the corner juggling chainsaws. I mean, you know. I find it to be right? the chainsaws. Right, right. That, you know, if it involves any kind of TV, media, publishing, or whatever, they, they're going for entertainment value. And um, Or a way to mock the science because they don't want mm -hmm. to admit that there is a scientific method to test these theories. Absolutely. And, and they, um, you, you know, as a paranormal investigator, you know, you need to immerse yourself in learning about physical science, biology, about how things work and how it can go awry. So that when, um, when you do investigate somewhere, you truly do have answers. And whether those answers are logically explainable or if they're truly paranormal um, and, and it makes you more confident in your findings absolutely um, it does because it, I can't stand feeling like I'm missing something which is when our conversations after an investigation go so long because mm -hmm. I, I saw something or experienced something I didn't get didn't mm -hmm. understand and you have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm just missing this. I don't understand this. Well, you know, it's you have to invest in reading, learning, educating yourself as much as you can. You know, your paranormal investigations are just like your diet, your exercise routine, your job, your anything that you own, your bank account. You can't expect to get more out of it than you're willing to put into it. You're right. When you edu when you educate yourself, when when you truly research and learn what can happen and do those case studies, and the more you prepare yourself for investigations, you're making an investment into the quality of your research and the quality of your investigation that will return with a greater quantity directly correlated to the quantity of research you put into it the same as you know you work on your you know you exercise harder you're gonna be in better shape you diet harder you're gonna lose more weight it's you know it, it's the same principle no matter what if you save more you're gonna make more interest and have more money at the end of the year you know that's um you know that it's just that simple that that rule of thumb applies to anything but absolutely paranormal investigation as well you know this has been one of everything in total this has been one of my favorite shows that we've ever done i'm i'm just so very glad that you're here because that well, yeah. that statement that you just made is probably the most important part of this interview all this discussion you you have to be well, prepared mm -hmm. you do i mean well it's the same as you know who, how many people do you know making six figures a year don't you know how many people do you see that make that much money from after dropping out of high school or um no 